cover Section 14.1 and 14.2. And actually, it might be true for the rest of the course that this is kind of the pattern. We kind of cover two sections on Thursdays and one section on Tuesday. That won't be totally true, but that's almost true. Um, for one thing, your book, well, I understand why they do what they do, kind of, but kind of not. Here, let, let, me, let me give you the, uh, the titles, first of all, and what, what they are. So section two is entitled Double Integrals and Something. Let's just leave it out for a minute. A double integral is going to be this simple. And I just want to go at, go at your intuitive knowledge here. What do you think I mean by a double integral? And again, everything we've done in Calc 3, we go back to our Calc 1 class and we say, okay, what did we do in Calc 1? We learned integrals. And actually, I can't wait because they just took their exam yesterday. And tomorrow, I'm going to introduce something called the antiderivative. Right? So you guys remember that. We did the same thing you know, a year ago. It's hard to believe that's only a year ago. But, but we did. And then when they come back, so they, they, they learn about going backwards, but they haven't learned what it's for yet. And when they come back, we'll spring upon them why we learned it. Well, that's what your book does in Chapter 14. They start to treat, in Section 1, they say, let's teach them how to do double integrals. But in my mind, it's too easy. And it's just a waste of my time to spend a whole day on it. What's more interesting is, what are they for? Okay, And that's why I want to get into Section 2 today. And honestly, we're getting into more theory than we would otherwise. So this is, this is better. More of what you'll need help on. You, you could almost figure out, yeah, you could figure out section one without any help from me. I'm sure of it. But I'm still going to give you some help on it. Okay? Um, so what do you think a double integral is for? Well, what's a single integral for? Uh, we've got to raise hands or this won't work. <laughs> Sorry, I know. Steve? Area under a curve. Area under a curve? Okay. And that, that's one nice answer. Now, there... Integrals are for other things, too. Don't forget that. But that's the first one we got. So let's go to its corresponding Calc 3 version. What's an integral going to be for? Volume under a surface. And actually, 14.2 is entitled Double Integrals and Volume. That's the, that's the title for... Section 14.2. Okay, so that is really what I want to cover today. Now, we had other hands up. Did anyone have other answers besides area under a curve? Jeremiah. We did use it for arc length. And I noticed you said surface area first because the analogy to arc length in our three-dimensional space is going to be surface area. And sure enough, Chapter 14, Section 5 is on surface area. So I don't think I'll need a whole period on that. Garrick? That's cool to think about. Yeah, wait a minute. Calc 1. We did volume of solid of Revolution, and I have asked myself the same question here. What can I do now? Can I somehow take my three-dimensional object and spin it through the fourth dimension and calculate something meaningful? I guess you can, but I don't have a nice answer for that one. But I've asked myself the same question. Other questions? Yeah. How do we use integrals for force? What do you mean by that? Yeah. Don't you do force times distance? Yeah. Because what's that equal? Work. Yeah. 
So work was an integral. Work became an integral. So now what? Gauss's law is coming, but we're going to wait until chapter 15 for that. Because, um, well, we kind of have to go back to vector world again. We're going to talk about vector fields, and, and then we'll talk about eventually what moves toward Gauss's law. So let's stay away from that. Yep? That's a good question. Are we going to even have an analogy here or not? I'm not sure. We'll see. We'll see. Um, yeah, this is more what I wanted to do in class, okay, is, is have you think about what the heck are we studying. Okay, so here's my first example. Oh, no, before the first example. These are the objectives of section 14.2 as listed by our book. Number one, well, that's what we just said, right? Represent the volume of a solid region. Meaning, well, let's see. When you find the area in Calc 1 using a single integral, it's the area, um, we always, I always say under a curve. But what do I really mean? Between the curve and the x-axis. Oh, we also did integrate the other way. Right? And then it's between the y-axis. That's right. That's coming back very soon, too. Um, so what, what are we going to do in this situation? We're going to be talking about the volume under a surface. What do I mean? From the surface to the xy plane. If z equals a function of x and y, then that's what we have. Okay. Number two, use properties of, oh, no kidding. Okay, number three, evaluate a double integral as an iterated integral. And by the way, this is 14.1. So 14.1, they teach you how to do it. 14.2, one of the objectives is we'd really like you to be able to do it now, for real. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so you ask a very good question. What happens if you go even up higher dimensions? The answer is, we are not giving you the full story about integration in this course. We are not. You learn about integration in calculus class, in Calc 3. Well, Calc 1 first, then Calc 3. If you keep going in mathematics, you might take a course in advanced multivariable calculus, where you might study some of these topics again, although some places, like where I went, they kind of skip some of it. Okay. Then, you can eventually take a course in what's called measure theory, which is really the study of integration, but you do a different kind of integral. Um, Lebesgue is the name of the guy. The Lebesgue integral is different than the integrals we're doing here, which are Riemann integrals. Now, we've, we've heard the word Riemann, right? Riemann what? We're going to see Riemann sums here. Lebesgue kind of had a more modern way of doing integration. And this is what has been done in the last 100 years, maybe, of integration. And it's what's used in, say, probability theory, for instance, where you need integrals all the time. And so in higher dimensions, I really think that this is what's done. OK? And notice I said think. OK. You know, it's, you asked a good question. Oh, and the last one here. So, so that's number three is, again, basically telling me I do really have to cover section one. And I, I will. And then number four here, find the average value of a function over a region. Do you remember doing this in Calc 1? 
I'm always kind of weak on it. Do you remember doing it? Yeah, because you didn't have me. Um, let's see. So average value. What do you remember? Anybody? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, here, let me draw a function for you guys. Give me a nice function. What a nice function. Okay. And let's put it on a closed interval. So let's go between, I don't know, 0 and let's go over here. That's uh, 5. Okay, so let's go from 0 to 5 and let's ignore everything else. So here's a point. And here's a point. And now let's say that this point is a height of, well, it looks like it's about 2. And at the top here it gets as high as maybe 6, right? Okay. So what's the average value of that function on the integral zero five on the interval <coughs> zero five? Make your best guess. Obviously, you can't be wrong because there's no function, there's no calculation up there. You're just kind of guessing. Around four. You guys think four is about the average value? Somewhere in that range, right? At least you didn't say twelve. I guess you could be wrong, but right? The function is always between 0 and 6 on that interval, and on the average it's 4. Now why do you say that? I don't know why you say that, Cliff. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to be 6, it's not going to be 2, it's going to be somewhere in the middle, it's 4, right? Well, well, here's what you do, is you integrate. If I compute the integral from, well, 0 to 5 of f of x dx, what is it I just computed? The area under the curve. Now let me draw the average value. See that? That's the average value. That red, that, the horizontal red line. If I computed the area under the red line, and if it really were the average value, that rectangle would have the same area as the area under the curve. Does that make sense? So that's what average value is. Okay, well what that means is, if you want just to know what the height is, you divide I'm sorry, just to know what the height is, because that's the average value, you divide by the length of the rectangle. So you do 1 over b minus a. And there's your formula for average value. 1 over b minus a, integral f of x dx. And you guys just reminded me that the week after break, I'll have to cover that. I really should. Well, that's an important application. But at least you guys remember the picture. That's good. That's all I really want. Okay. I don't care if you remember the formula. So, my first example is here. If you want to copy it down, we can spend a minute uh, sketching. Linda insisted that we sketch this uh, while I go shut the door. It's too loud. Right. So let's do this. Let's do, thank you, Dan. Z equals F of X, Y. And that's this. Thank you. Do I have to sketch Dan's? No, okay. Go ahead and give it a shot. See if you guys can sketch this. All right, now that I have a nice clean slide, I'm going to try and sketch it. So, get the blue marker out. We'll go from there. Uh, let's see, I want the x, y, and z axes here. So one thing I'll do is I'll plot 0, 0, 4 right there. So there's one point on the surface. And then I want to plot more points. So I'm going to let y equals 0, right? And I see that I have, if y equals 0, I'm in the xz plane. This, this right here is just a parabola opening downward, right? So along the xz plane, I have a parabola opening downward. And along, now if I do the same thing, if I let 
x equals 0, I'm in the yz plane, and then I have 4 minus 1 16th y squared, which is also parabola opening downward. What would you say about that parabola compared to the first one? Growing less. Yeah, so it's kind of a wider, right? Okay, that's an awful parabola. Let me try again. Somewhere like that, right? And so the surface, I don't know, it kind of angles down this way, right? Like if I went over some certain region. Because what I'm going to do here, actually, I had a, a problem in mind when I gave I want to find the volume. Here's, here's the problem. Um, find the volume of the solid bounded by the coordinate planes So that's the xz plane, the yz plane, and the xy plane. Um, by x equals 3, by y equals 2, and by the function. Okay, so can I really draw that? Okay, so x equals 3, well, that's right here, right? Here's 1, oh, no, here's 1, 2, 3. So I'm saying that that's kind of where I cut it off, right? That this arc here is at x equals 3. And then y equals 2, let's say that's right there, that's where I cut it off there. You guys get this picture? So basically, I'm taking a small region. And what's going to be important when you do double integrals? is the region on the xy plane. See, if I wanted to do this right, what I could do is I could split it up into six rectangles. What do I mean split up into six rectangles? I have a rectangular region of the xy plane, right? That is kind of the shadow of the surface. If you had a light pointing straight down, it's the shadow of the surface. It's the projection of the surface onto the xy plane. Your book is going to call that region R. And what we'll do is eventually, when we say we want to find this volume, we're going to write, we're finding the double integral over the region R of f of x, y. Now what's your book write? I think they write d, a. Why do they write d, a? I'm not exactly sure. The area vector? What do you mean by that? You're probably right. I, I guess I'm just trying to understand it. Um, to me, area is a quantity, not a vector. So why do you say area vector? Do you know? Yeah. OK. Well, for us, dA is just kind of what you put with a double integral for now. OK. And, and we'll, maybe we'll. I hope by the end of this course we're going to understand why we're putting it. And maybe it does have something to do with what Jonathan said. Yeah, I guess. It, well, th well, that's it. When you teach a Calc 1 student to integrate with respect to x, for a long time they don't know what that means. Actually, even when you get to Calc 3, I'm not sure you know what it means yet either, other than that's the variable that I'm 
thinking of as the main variable. Although now, you, because we did partial derivatives, you have a better idea. Because even when we used to write this, you're kind of like, okay, that means take the derivative. But now you understand that that, that that may be different than this, right? And of course, if it's partials, then I'll put the curly stuff. Okay, so we, we get some ideas here. Good, good, good. Now, okay. How do, how do I how do I solve this problem? Well, let me do this. Let me start off by approximating the answer. Let's approximate the answer. choosing the midpoint, which I'll call xiyi of each of these six squares. I'm going to take the midpoint of each of those squares. What do you think I'm going to do then? Yes. So I want to compute basically f of each of those, right? And then what? So let's see what you said. Let's take this one here. Go all the way up until it touches at some point on the surface. Right, so what I do now is I take a box of that height. And the box of that height, right, well, I guess it would go all the way to the edge. But, but some of it might be below the surface and some of it might be above the surface. Do you guys see that or not? Yeah, let me show you. I can't do this, and that's why it's so good to have. That's what we're doing. Figure 1410 from your book shows you what you're doing. Some of it is still inside the surface. Some of it is outside the surface, right? First, what? Well, wouldn't that be nice? Because if it is a 3D Riemann sum, yeah. But what I'm saying is if it's a 3D Riemann sum, Riemann sums, you could take the limit as, well, how did that work in Calc 1? What's a Riemann sum? The limit as the norm. I'm glad they used that word. Because I didn't use that word with my class. I cheated them. Yeah, the, the size of a partition, right? So, so we need to talk about what the size of a partition is. All right, well, you guys are asking for it, so let's keep moving. All right, so choose a point for each rectangle. And by the way, I said I was going to choose a midpoint, right? There is no reason you have to choose the midpoint. And there is a whole science behind, hey, what's a good way to approximate the value of the integral? Because you guys took enough Calc 2 to know there are plenty of integrals out there that you cannot compute. And so what do we do? We approximate them. And there are whole courses in numerical approximation, meaning let's approximate integrals. And um, what do you do? Well, you think of smart ways of choosing x, i, y, i, for instance. Now, I'm doing the midpoint, which is pretty good for this example especially. But there's other ways, too. And then we form rectangular prisms. And then I'm about to continue, but we have a question. So, let's see. So yes, Simpson's rule is exactly what we're talking about when I say there's numerical approximation. How is it done in higher dimensions? I don't have a good answer right now. 
No. That was the one we actually did that gave us the best results. But there are plenty of things better than Simpson's. Simpson's rule works for anything, any polynomial degree two or less. And yes, there's an analog of Simpson's rule for what we're doing here. Sure. Okay. Well, this is all your books discussion. I can type this out, but um, is it worth talking about? Yeah, let's see. Because the area of the ith rectangle is delta ai. Oh, I don't want to do that yet. I want to finish my numbers. Uh, what do you want? Numbers or letters? We're going to take a vote. How many want numbers? How many want letters? Don't care. I will do numbers. Don't go back to letters. Just that we, we moved ahead because we had pictures. Okay. So we choose the midpoint of each of these six squares. So then what do you do? You say the volume, V, will be approximately equal to, and you guys understand what I'm doing, right? I'm going to do F of 0 0.5, 0 0.5 times 1 plus, and that, that's this first dot, the one I tried to draw. And then I would have to do F of 1.5, 0 0.5 times 1, right? Plus, and I would have six of those, right? Six of these. So I guess the last one would be plus F of 2.5, uh, 1.5. And I actually worked that all out for you. And I got, that was approximately, um, let's see, 21.59. That that's our approximate integral. is what you want to figure out. That's right. Let me, let me show you, because maybe this will help. Let's compare this. Compare that to doing um, F of, now what's the midpoint of the whole thing? I guess that'd be right here, right? Let me just do one big rectangular prism. I mean, that's, a, that's not a bad approximation either for this example. One big rectangular prism. So what's that? That's the point um, 1.5 comma 1.5 for both? No. One. one. Okay. 1 1.5 comma 1 times, well, then I'd want to multiply by 6, right? Because length times width is 2 times 3 times this, this height, whatever it is. And if you do that, I think I worked that out too. Yeah. I got... Uh, 21.375. Okay. So there's one answer. And here's this answer. They're pretty close, right? So maybe the actual value is somewhere around there. Okay. So now I'm ready to move on. So we showed you those pictures. Okay. Because the area of the ith rectangle is delta ai. Why did they put delta? Well, because the area is going to change. Because you're right, we're going to be, well, taking more rectangles and making them smaller. It follows that the volume of the ith prism is, well, just what I did, right? Because this is the height. And this is the area, which was either 1 or 6 in my example. Okay, and moving on, we get, you can approximate the volume of the solid by the Riemann sum of the volumes of all n prisms. Yeah. So the idea of the Riemann sum is that, yes, you take the limit as the norm. Is this how your book writes it? It goes to zero? That 
means the size of a part. Well, in Calc 1, it meant the size of a partition. And how did you measure the size of a partition? You looked at what's the largest of the intervals that are there. Yeah, the, the largest piece, and that was what we called the size. Now, oh, and why do we write this? Well, because, and you, I don't know, you probably remember in Calc 1, we did these problems, and when this happened, what else happened is that n goes to what? Infinity, right? n goes to infinity. Now, it's not enough to just let n go to infinity. Maybe your Calc 1 teacher told you that. No, yeah, you might just be taking one little rectangle and chopping it up over and over again, but never touching the stuff elsewhere, right? And we don't want that to happen. So we don't just write limit as n goes to infinity. A Riemann sum is a sum where you take the limit as the part size of the partition goes to zero, and that pushes n to infinity, and then everything nice happens. That's kind of what a Riemann sum is. It's good enough for this class, anyways. If you want to study more, you take analysis and then go from there. And maybe you go to Lebesgue measure. Okay. So let's see. Um, blah. We get a double interval. Now, how do you compute a double interval? Well, <laughs> okay. So that's what your book calls an iterated integral. All right. So let me show you. We need um, a big theorem. Which your book calls Fubini's theorem. So, Fubini was a uh, mathematician in Italy that I think he died in the 1940s or something like that. Um, Fubini's theorem says. Evaluate double integrals as iterated integrals, which I haven't explained yet, I understand, in either order. And what do I mean by that? show you. Okay? So, do I want to write it out? No, because we're going to get to break, and I do want to finish this example at least before break. So let me do this. Let me have you evaluate the following. Integral. Integral. And I'm actually going to put limits of integration on here. I'm going to say we're evaluating from 0 to 3. And I'm going to say we're evaluating from 0 to 2. Okay. And we're going to evaluate 4 minus 1 ninth x squared minus 1 sixteenth y squared. Okay. That's the function. And I think, I don't even know that your book's going to put parentheses like that, but I always do, just to be a little redundant. Now, okay, what you want to put next is either dx or dy. That's what you want to do. You want to work kind of as if there were parentheses here, which there are not. But let me ask this. When I'm integrating from 0 to 2, do you see what I'm doing in the picture? Let's go back to the, the picture we drew. What's changing as I go from 0 to 2? The y is changing, right? 
you're moving from y equals 0 to y equals 2. Okay? So that's considered a dy integration. So I guess, no, I'm trying to figure it out. statement, okay? I'm really leery about writing something like dA equals dx times dy, because that's weird. Those are what are called differentials, which we studied, right? We actually studied a two-dimensional differential now. But I don't like, I won't even write it. You might be able to find that online somewhere someday, and they'll pin me down. No, I I don't want that. Um, yeah, they're, they're, I just hate the word direct. I don't know. I, I don't know. Yes, there is. It's like this, because we did this in Calc 1. We studied, someone mentioned arc length. And when you, in, when you wanted to find the arc length, you might remember that you had to do the square root of 1 plus y prime squared uh, dx. That's what you had to integrate. Do you remember that? Some books will actually say you're integrating ds, where that means you're doing this. And that gives me x, the arc length. So what is ds? It's the differential that is really the square root of 1 plus y prime squared dx. Or, if you're in parametric, it's the square root of dx dt squared plus dy squared dt squared dt. There's a lot of different ways to write it. Okay. Let's do some numbers. Let's go take a break. Come on, let's work it out. What do we get? Well, I integrate dy. That means treat x as a constant. So we get 0 to 3. Oh, you guys worked that out. Uh, no, no, half of you worked that out. And then whoever has not written anything down yet, I mean anything, you have to do it the other way. 0 to 2, 0 to 3. So you guys that are just starting to write now can write this down. Okay. So you're going to integrate dx and then integrate dy. Now we want to see what we get. So see, you keep the 0 to 2 there, and you do your integration. Okay, okay people that are doing it this way, I'm going to help you out a little bit. So how does this work? When you integrate dy, you get 4y minus 1 ninth x squared y, right? Minus, oh boy. 1 over 48y cubed. Is that right? And luckily I was so kind that I have one of the limits is 0, so that's really nice. And the other limit is 2. And so this is the integral from 0 to 3 of, well see this just becomes a big mess, doesn't it? One thing I do sometimes is I write down right here y equals 0 to y equals 2 to remind me that 
X's I'm not going to plug in for. You guys see what I'm talking about? I get 8 minus 2 ninths X squared. And then when I put the 2 in there, I get 8, so I get 1 sixth. And so now I'm integrating this DX. And now I'm down to calc 1 at least. That make sense? That's 2 ninths. There are people that were doing it this way. You guys got 4x minus 127x cubed. Um, what do I do here? I'll just write minus 116xy squared, right? And I'll go from x equals 0 to x equals 3. And so you guys are doing the integral from 0 to 2 of, let's see, 12. Oh, when you put 3 in there, it works out really nice. 3 cubed is 27. So 27 over 27 is 1. Minus 1. And then minus 3 sixteenths y squared. I like this one better. So let's see. When I integrate this guy, I get 11y, and then I get y cubed over 3, so minus 1 y cubed, and I'm going from 2 to 0. So I get 22 minus Eight sixteenths minus a half. I get twenty one point five. That's pretty close to our approximation. Our approximation was twenty one point five seven, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Twenty one point five nine was our approximation. Twenty one point five is the exact value of the integral. Uh, twenty one point three seven five. So the, so the actual value is between those two approximations, I noticed. Yeah. Um, what about uh, you guys that did 0 to 3? Does anyone get that? You got it, Adam? 21.5? Okay, we'll take his word on it then and we'll take a break. Okay? So uh, we'll come back and see what happens with the rest of this. If any of you want to talk about projects, uh, in, in this example, you have to understand, we made it very, very simple. Uh, in a number of ways. See, notice that I started with one big rectangular region, R. Okay? When you do a single integral, you do an integral over really an interval, AB. And what we do is we put the A here and we put the B up there. Right? Okay. When you do a double integral, you are doing an integral over a region R. And the extra dimension makes a big difference in how complicated the problem is. Because how do we handle the double integral? Well, we jump ahead and we do what we did uh, where? Well, here. Um, yeah, here's my definition. The definition is it's the limit as the size of the partition goes to zero of this Riemann sum, provided that the limit exists. And so could it be that the double integrals are infinite? Yes. Um, are we going to have a section on improper double integrals? I don't think we're going to have that, actually. I think, I think we're done with that. But if the limit exists, then f is integrable over r. Jonathan has a question already. Double integrals have a direction. Oh, okay. 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 So I think what you're comparing to is in Calc 1, I mentioned I'm going to do antiderivatives with my Calc 1 class tomorrow. What are they going to learn about? They're going to learn about single integrals with no symbol, 
right? No, no limits of integration, okay? Do we have that for double integrals? Yeah, you have to, you have to do or C Y plus C depending which direction you do it. And all of a sudden that's getting really weird. Yeah, so, I mean, there's all kinds of things and if you wanna go invent your own mathematics, that's kinda cool. Um, well, that's what we do, right? <laughs> Absolutely, that's what mathematics is, is discovery. Yeah, wow, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Um, we're sticking to the, I guess we're sticking to the analogy of definite integrals here, okay? So we're gonna integrate over a region. Oh, when does the limit exist? So you guys know what this means by now? I know I explained that in here, do you remember what it means? Sufficient conditions. No, 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 no. For the double integral on of f on the region R to exist, R, and then I should put a little colon here. So, so I guess my question is, does this phrase make sense to you? When I say these are sufficient conditions, and I'm about to tell you what they are, don't read the rest of them. Do you know what it means to say that I have sufficient conditions? Here, here's an example. Okay guys, I have a function in Calc 1. I want to know, is it differentiable? Okay, I'm going to tell you it's continuous. Is that sufficient for it to be differentiable? And I heard some no, and why is the answer no? Give me an example of a function that's continuous at a point, but not differentiable at the point. That's my favorite. Y is the absolute value of X, is continuous at zero. I actually just did this yesterday in Calc 1, but not differentiable at zero, right? Okay, so we would say, okay, yeah, what's smooth mean? Well, I don't know, but yeah, but, but continuity is not a sufficient condition. It's a necessary condition, okay? Now, Sufficient conditions. This means, hey guys, if you know this, so if all this coming up, then the double integral will exist. Okay? So what's the if? If R can be written as a union of a finite number of non overlapping subregions that are vertically or horizontally simple. So there's something I have to define. And you also need F to be continuous on the region R. Wow, that's a lot. What? Yeah, F is a function right now in, in um, of two variables, right? Oh no. Um, well, okay. You want to do the, so I guess Matt wants to really understand the part before the word and, doesn't he? So I do want to do that. But I think my preference is, can I first talk about the part after the word and? Because I think that's easier and I want to get it out of the way. Well, I don't know if it's easier, but I think we did it. Didn't we talk about f of x, y being continuous? That's one thing you need. Oh, that's good. That's what you needed in count one. You needed to have a continuous function if you wanted to integrate. So in count three, you also need f of x, y is continuous on a region r. And did we study that? Yeah, I think if you check back to section 12.3, we talked about the limit as x, y approaches some point c of f of x, y has to be f of, maybe I should call it, you know, x naught, y naught. Uh, this has to equal f of x naught, y naught. And that's true for every point x naught, y naught in R, then you're continuous on the whole region. Some of you guys just turned off the off switch for a second, so. 
You're like, oh, I covered it before. Forget it. All right. But we covered that. Okay, let's go back to this then, which you're more interested in. So vertically and horizontally simple. What does that mean? Hmm. And what does non-overlapping mean? Well, here's non-overlapping. Picture from the book. Two regions are non-overlapping if their intersection is a set that has an area of zero. So if you have a region, and if you draw a curve or a line through it, the curve or line itself actually has an area of zero, because it doesn't have any width per se, right? Just length, if you want. So then these two regions are non-overlapping. That's what they're saying. So what's happening here, let me go back to that big mouthful. Okay, if R can be written as a union of a finite number, for me the finite number was six, <laughs> of non-overlapping subregions, okay, that are, oh, I see. See, maybe originally, whatever this means, vertically simple or horizontally simple, maybe originally my region is not vertically simple or not horizontally simple. But maybe if I can divide it up into a finite number of regions that are like this, then I can integrate. And we're going to see that in a minute. I have to explain what vertically and horizontally simple mean. Here. Imagining a surface above that S. Okay. No, it's not saying that. It's not saying that. Because when I, okay, and this is an important thing to understand. Every time that our book writes R, R is um, part of a plane. It's two-dimensional. Does that make sense? Actually, usually it's going to be the XY plane. We'll have a region R in the XY plane. So when you told me to draw this, I was picturing it as part of the uh, XY plane. And then the surface is above it. So you're finding the volume of, well, between the surface and this letter S, which is kind of weird because a bunch of rectangles like this. Right? Where is that? Let's wait on overlapping. I'll show you. Well, overlapping is this. Here. Here's a, okay, here, watch. Time out, time out. Time out, time out. Where'd I go? Where's my picture? Oh, it disappeared. Oh, here's the picture. Guys, this region that we had was right there. I could have done it this way. I could have said, okay, here's region one. And then this big loop is region two. You know, the MasterCard logo is overlapping, right? Region one is yellow and region two is red. Actually, I think they did orange and then they put red in the middle, which is really kind of bizarre. But, right? MasterCard logo is two overlapping circles. It's also three non overlapping regions. I wonder if you can integrate over the MasterCard logo. find out by the end of today's class. All right. It depends what vertically and horizontally simple mean. Okay, now, this is a great visual in my mind. What are you doing when you do an iterated integral? Remember the first time we did this, we integrated from 0 to I forget, and then 0 to I forget, but we did dy, and then we did dx, right? And when we integrated dy, what you're doing is you're obtaining the area of a cross-section. Now, 
about which cross section? Well, kind of every cross section. Because you were integrating a function and you got a new function. And the new function gives you the area of the cross section kind of anywhere you want. I think I'm going to look at it and see if I believe that in a second. Okay. And then when you integrate with x, respect to x, then you fill out the volume. It makes sense to you? Yeah. 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 Now notice when we integrated dy, we got rid of the y's, didn't we? And what did we get? We got a function of x. <laughs> well, we got a function of x inside, then we were going to integrate it. Now what function did we get? Well, it was a parabola opening downward, right? And then basically we know that what we were really doing here is finding the area under that parabola. And somehow that gave me the volume of the whole thing. Now why? Because the area under this parabola somehow represents the cross-sectional areas as you move along the y direction. Yeah. For a given value of x, you have a certain number that's here. And you're going to send x from 0 to 3. If you had fixed that particular value of x when you did the first integral, you would have gotten a cross-sectional area, if that makes sense. Now, there's something weird that happens, though. And that is that um, most of the time, you don't have four numbers here. This was a very s simple example where that happens. And I'll show you why we had numbers there and why we usually don't. At least that's my goal here. All right, so let me keep moving. Oh, yeah, I mentioned Fubini. Here's his theorem. They call it 14.2. At least this is one version of it. If you do Lebesgue measure, you get a completely different version, but it's the, it's the same idea that you could switch the order of integration. You could do dy dx, or you could do dx dy, and you get an integral. Oh, I want you to notice something. Let's read through a little bit more carefully, because we're going to use some words here. Let f be continuous, right? That was one on a plane region R. That was one requirement. What was the other requirement? Okay, let's see. Number one, if R is defined by it's a region between A and B and between two functions. See those two functions? Can I draw a picture of this here? So in, in example one, region R is between X equals A <laughs> and x equals b. Okay. And it's between some function, which is, I guess this is g2 of x, and some function, which is g1 of x. See that? If you have this situation, then you can integrate dy dx. First integrate with respect to y, then integrate with respect to x. Okay. Let's see what your book's going to do with this. Yes, you're taking, yes getting cross sections. So what your book will write, when, when they draw a picture like this, they'll, they'll draw the region R, 
and then they'll put a rectangle like this, and they'll say that's my delta x. Okay, that's my little tiny change in x, and notice that that's the outside variable, right? And by the way, this is what you call a vertically simple region. Let me make sure I have that right. Yeah, this is vertically simple because you have a bunch of rectangles, right? In other words, I have two vertical lines as boundaries, and everything else I'm bounded above and below by continuous functions, right? G1 and G2 have to be continuous on that interval AB. You see that? So, um, yeah, so this is a, th this example number one is where R, the way they could have said it very quickly is that R is vertically simple. That's just a very fast way of saying all that. Okay. So number two is, the book will say R is horizontally simple. So for you to be able to integrate this way, what do you need? Well, you need a couple of lines, y equals c and y equals d, like this. And then I guess you would need a couple of continuous functions. Um, how would I do this? Uh, I'll call this, and these are functions of y, right? So this, uh, this one we'll call h1 of y, this one we'll call h2 of y, and then you'll put the little delta y here. Okay, and so what are you doing? First you integrate dx, and what that means is above each little delta y, you are getting a, a sheet, right? You're getting a cross section. So remember, z is kind of coming at you out of the screen. And then you integrate from y equals c to y equals d to get all the sheets and add them together. Does, does that make sense? I'm trying. The top one is you get a bunch of sheets that are of thickness delta x, and then you move from x equals a to x equals b in the end. But notice what's different here is that in general, you have functions of x for, this, for the inside integral. In our example, these were flat, and so they were actually the function. So like when we did ours, what did we do? The first, oh, I guess we did it this way. The first time we did it, we did um, integral from, it was dy, it was 0 to 2 dy. But what we did first was we integrated the function x equals 0 to x equals 3 dx. And then this was the function. Remember that? In general, what you'll have is x equals, I don't know, y squared to x equals 4 minus the sine of y. Okay? You'll have functions in there. And that's okay. It's okay to have functions in one direction as long as you have flat lines in the other direction. Does this make sense? I have an example to show you how this works. Okay, I'm going to find the double interval over R of, and, and here's the function xy. So, z equals xy. I'm not sure we've ever studied that function yet. You might wonder, what does that look like? You might be able to picture it. It's kind of a cool looking surface. Anytime one of the variables is zero, we're at zero. That's one of the things that's nice about it, right? So if I were to think of a graph, I know that right along the axis it's, it meets there. And then it kind of grows, especially if you move in this direction, it really grows, right? Okay. Well, anyways, that's the function we're going to integrate. 
And let's integrate this function, so dA is what I write, where R is the region um, bounded by y equals x squared and y equals 4. Okay. When you have to do a double integral problem, the important thing to do is to do a sketch of r, the region you're integrating over. It's not so important to do what I was doing up here. That's kind of fun. I like doing that. But you definitely want to sketch r. Okay. So what do we do? Well, let's draw y equals x squared. Yeah, this is a very good first example. Okay, there's y equals x squared. And y equals 4, of course, is just a line. And what do you think I'm going to be most interested in here? Maybe these points of intersection, right? What are these? Okay, so we have 2 comma 4, and we have negative 2 comma 4. And so the, the big question you're going to ask yourself when you start doing double integrals is you're going to say, should I integrate dx dy, or should I integrate dy dx? In other words, which order should I do it? Then there'll be other questions we ask later, like is there an easier way to do it, because these are too hard. Um, so what I'm going to ask myself is, is this vertically simple or horizontally simple? And maybe this one's very easy, but maybe not. This is vertically simple, because if I draw these vertical lines, right, I am between negative 2, and positive 2, right? And then I am between two really nice functions, and that's my region R. So to do this integral, what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate. Now remember, you put numbers on the outside. And so that's dx. And I put functions on the inside. Now from what to what? Well, which one goes where? What's on the bottom of region R? X squared is on the bottom, right? Yeah, so we want to go from X squared to 4. And do you think it makes a difference if I put it the other way? Well, you'd get the sign wrong, right? We know that. So we'll go from X squared to 4. And then I'm integrating dy there. And what is it I'm integrating? The function xy. And that'll give me the volume. Oh, not quite. Well, what's kind of weird about this, it's not volume anymore. Because think about this quadrant here. Where is that in the three-dimensional plane? That's where y is still positive, but x is negative. So that's back here, right? If I, if I extended that x-axis back, that's back here. So my region R is really this parabola and that line y equals 4. Can you see it? I don't know. But where's the surface back there? Remember I said the surface is going to hit this axis. So the surface is going to be below the xy plane. So then do you remember how what, when you integrate something that goes below the x-axis in Calc 1, what happens to the value of the integral? Oh, you don't remember? You have to subtract, right? Because you get the negative, right? Like if you integrate something that's below the x-axis, you're going to get, I used to call it negative area. You get a negative value. So the area is positive. So all of a sudden, this might not mean volume anymore. I'm OK with that. I just want us to practice computing. You guys with me on that? OK, so let's compute. So what do we get? Well, we work inside out. So let's keep the negative 2 to 2. And when we integrate dy, what do we get? 
about one half x y squared. Is that okay? Because I treat x as a constant. We happy? Okay. And we're going to go from um, y equals x squared to y equals 4, and then we're going to integrate dx when we're done. So let's see, this is 1 half integral negative 2 to the 2. And what do I put in here? Uh, looks like I'll get 16x minus, oh wow, x to the fifth, right? x squared squared, then another x is x to the fifth. I brought the one half out front. 4 squared is 16. Well, I brought the 1 half out front. I guess I didn't have to, but I, I brought it out front. dx. So you're right. It's a to the better. So then it's 1 half. And when I integrate 16x, I get uh, 8x squared. 8x squared minus 1 sixth x to the 6th. Okay. I'm going from negative 2 to positive 2. Oh, what do I get? Zero. Why? Yeah, I have, I have an even function, and I'm putting in negative 2 and 2. So I'm going to get 0. Oh, now, okay, here's a good question. What if I had just integrated from 0 to 2 and doubled it? Well, I guess depends where you're talking about. See, look at this right here, guys. That integral is a calc 1 integral. And in calc 1, we studied that kind of polynomial. We called it an odd function. And if you integrate an odd function over negative 2 to 2, get zero, right? We, we learned that because you're going to, exactly what happened is going to happen. I want to point this out though. You may not, at the very beginning, do the double integral from zero to two and multiply by two. It doesn't work. Why? Because you don't necessarily have that kind of symmetry with this function z. I worked it out here and I didn't, unless I made a mistake. I know. Yeah, the single integral, you can use your symmetry. Time out a sec. Yeah, I, I think the big point is that I'm using a property here of functions of one variable. I'm using the property of being odd. That function doesn't hold true when you have a function of two variables. I mean, that's not an odd or even function, x, y. It's a strange function. I mean, it's a function of two variables. So I can't use that kind of symmetry in the same way that you did in Calc 1. Okay? But that was my reason for picking that example. Now. Back to, um, let's see, final problem. Yeah, you're going to have things like this. Find the volume of the solid above the xy plane. Bounded by the, to go back to chapter 11, elliptic paraboloid z equals x squared 
plus 4y squared. And the cylinder x squared plus 4y squared equals 4. Wow. So can we draw a sketch? Can we draw a sketch? I guess we can, can't we? If well, what do you mean by that? When you say z equals 4, what does that mean? That's where the intersection is, right? I mean, the, the elliptic paraboloid, what is that? Well, it, if you look at any particular z, it's an ellipse that's longer in the y direction than it is in the x direction, right? But it, you know... It's like a parabola everywhere else. So here's your here's some some cross some z values, some cross sections of your elliptic parabola, level curves if you want that are up in space though. And then when I draw a cylinder, well you guys know what that looks like, right? And so what we're saying is is that this cylinder is going to hit that paraboloid, and, and this cylinder is an elliptical so cylinder, right? So this cylinder is going to hit at exactly one of the level curves, right? So what do you want to do? You want to take R. R is where? On the what? XY plane, right? So down here is the XY plane. You want to draw R, which is the image that you're going to integrate over. And where do we want to integrate over? Well, right over the intersection. Right there, that's z equals 4, right? And so what, what would r be? r is the ellipse, in this case, well, x squared plus 4y squared equals 4, or x squared over 4 plus y squared over 1 equals 1. I mean, however it is, but you, you draw it. That's the ellipse that you want. Oh, I guess I had these wrong, drawn incorrectly. I guess it's longer in the x direction than it is in the y direction. Okay. But it's an ellipse. And so what you do is you draw the ellipse. And you say, that's my region. Now, is this region horizontally simple or vertically simple? or both? Well, the answer is both. The idea, again, is you want to integrate from a number to a number, like this. And then you want to be going from a function to a function when you draw one of the rectangles. Here's showing it's vertically simple. And are these nice functions? Well, I don't know. I, let's see. This is the x-axis and this is a y-axis. So are, the, are these red curves function of x's the way I'm drawing them or functions of y? I'm thinking of these as y is f of x, right? Okay, so what would be the function? Well, you'd have to solve for y. So if I solve for y, let's see, I get y squared is 1 fourth of 4 minus x squared in parentheses, right? So y is, well, plus or minus the square root. Well, what's the square root of a fourth? One half. The square root of 4 minus x squared. So sure enough, you would integrate, you know, the, the final answer, the final integral, and then I'm done because we're out of time. You would integrate from this number to that number. Now, how far are those out? I guess from negative 4 to 4 dx, I'll put on the very outside. 
and then I would integrate from y equals negative 1 half square root of 4 minus x squared to positive 1 half square root of 4 minus x squared. So put the dy there then. And then I put the function here. What's the function we're going to integrate? Yeah, x squared plus 4 y squared. That'll be uh, underneath the paraboloid. So basically you'd be kind of outside of the paraboloid and inside the ellipse is what you're finding the volume of. put this on Blackboard hopefully tomorrow and uh, have it for you over the break if you need it and I won't see you until a week from Tuesday, okay?